called um, How Good Java Habits Can Encourage Bad JavaScript Habits. Um, and this talk stemmed from, uh, I did an architecture review for a client, and they came from a background similar to you all. To, to you all and um, I could just see the same errors, or the same bad code over and over again, because you could tell that they didn't understand the difference between Java and JavaScript. Even though it ha shares the same word Java, <laughs> it's still very different. Um, I've heard a quote, uh, Java is to JavaScript is ham is the hamster. Like, they're, they're obviously diff different. Um, so again, I'm Elijah. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP. Uh, I work for Appintu, which is a company that's dedicated to jQuery. So we do all front end development. Um, and uh, you can email me at elijah.manor at gmail. Um, I'm on Twitter, Elijah Manor, and elijahmanor.com is my blog. Which, by the way, this talk is recorded, recorded and available on my blog for you to, to watch. So um, this talk is based on a set of three articles that I wrote for enterprisejQuery.com, which Appintu hosts. And um, it just seemed, people seemed to like the topic. Um, in, in that case, I really the same points apply to C Sharp and Java. Um, you know, I, I know that language. I know the languages are different, but the uh, the concepts apply for either one. So the first concept we're going to talk about that um, is a bad habit is Java developers don't understand that there's something called falsy values in JavaScript. Whereas you you might be familiar with you know, when you write an if statement, you usually want to resolve into a, a Boolean, false or true. But in JavaScript, there's a lot of different, well, there's um, six different values that could be rendered as false. And these are considered falsy. So one is just a Boolean false, which everyone probably understands. You know, obviously that's false. Null can, can be considered false, which, you know, that kind of makes sense. There's something undefined. In JavaScript, you don't really have to define all your variables, so that's considered false. And this might be a little surprising, is an empty string is considered false if you were to test it in an if statement. Uh, zero, which if you ever did, you know, just raw C code, um, you might remember that. And then uh, there's something uh, not a number. You know, it's just, uh, it's yeah, not a number. So these six things are all false. Anything that's not these six things is true. So an empty object is true, the string false is true, you know, it's a string, so, and it has a length, so it's true. So the next several points are going to piggyback off this, this concept, um, and one of them is not testing or setting default values correctly. So something you might see, based on your knowledge of Java, you might, um, in JavaScript, you might test something that's not null and it has a length. That's just kind of a common thing that, you know, you always want to test for null because you don't want to have that object reference null error. Um, but you don't really need to do that in JavaScript because of false values. So just like we talked before, um, null was false, empty string was false, uh, undefined is false. So really all you have to do is just check for the variable. And what it does behind the scenes, it makes sure it's not undefined null or empty. Um, if it is, if it does have a value, then it gets inside the if statement. Um, and so this is the, the way you would see um, JavaScript libraries testing for this. They wouldn't actually check for not null or link, they just do it like this. So this is considered better code, just because you understand what a falsy, falsy and a truthy value is. You also see some code like this. Um, if you come from JavaScript and you want to set a default value, uh, you don't have to, you know, test for null. Because just like we said before, um, there's ways to do that a little bit better. So instead of testing for null and then setting a default value, or doing some crazy ternary operator, uh, you know, it's not null, set this value. If it is null, set default value. Instead of doing all that, which you may write similar code in Java, you can use this approach, which looks kind of funky, but um, but because of falsy values, it works. So um, first, you test for your variable. If it's null, um, null empty, or any of those six things, then that will be false. And so it's going to look for something true. So it looks 
it used a logical or statement. And then if it was false, then it will use this value to prime your variable. So this is a technique. It looks kind of hokey because you're like, oh, I would never think to do that. But this is what you see in, in JavaScript libraries. Like if you looked in the jQuery source code or um, other libraries, um, that's kind of the way they do that. So really the, the key point for the first several um, examples is just to know what the falsity values are. There's six of them. Uh, just commit those to memory and if it's, if it's one of those, it's false. If it's not, it's true. Uh, the next thing that you'll find kind of odd is um, you might want to use the double equals uh, statement or the not equals and that's generally considered a bad practice in JavaScript. Um, they're there, but don't use them because the double equals, not only it, it tries to figure out if the two values on the left and right are equal, but it tries to be smart. And so it's like, it'll try to coerce each each variable or each value. It tries to make them the same type. It'll convert them to try to make them the same type and then it'll test it, um, which gives you a lot of crazy values. So for example, null equals undefined. Well, you wouldn't think that would be true, but it is, it, using the double equals, it is true. And even crazier things like zero equals a tab and a, a character, character term line feed, that's true. Um, and those are things you probably don't want. And if you use that, your code's probably going to have a weird bug in it. So in JavaScript, there's something called the triple equals, which is considered, it's called the identity operator. And what that, the behavior of this one is probably what you expect. Like all these um, tests are false. Because that just makes sense to me that zero is not empty string. And so the triple equals, it doesn't try to, to convert uh, the values into the same type. It just tests, you know, is zero the same thing as an empty string? No, it's not. Rock on. So to keep your sanity, use triple equals, and there's a not double equals, which is its counterpart. So this would be a simple thing that unless you took time to learn JavaScript, you wouldn't know about this, and it could actually cause a lot of problems if you don't use it. So the key point is, technically there's some cases where you don't have to use the triple equals, but if, by doing it, it's not going to harm you. So just go ahead and do it. Um, the next thing is um, declaring arrays and objects. You might be tempted to uh, new up a new object or new up a new array, which technically you could do, but these were kind of added uh, late in the game when JavaScript was made kind of to appease Java developers because it looked more familiar to them. Um, behind the scenes, it's doing a couple extra steps. It's not necessary. There's a native way to do that in the language. Um, and there's actually some cool things you could do with it, um, and I'll show you in a second. But to create a new object, you just say first thing equals uh, curly brace, open brace, close brace. Um, and to create a new array, you just use the square bracket. It's not a big thing, but it just shows that, um, well, there's some cool things you could do when you use them. So um, by using the curly braces, we could immediately initialize an object. We could create it and set its values. And so we're creating a person here using this native syntax. We could immediately set some properties, first name, last name, and actually set a, a function at the same time with its um, implementation. Uh, and if you use the native syntax for arrays, you could automatically give them values. You could have nested arrays. You could have uh, multi-dimensional arrays. So by using this technique, it's a little bit better. Both of them will work, but the other one uses a lot more code and just shows that you don't necessarily know what's going on. So the best practice is to try to use the native ways to do objects and arrays. And you know, reserve the new keyword for your own custom constructors. Think of it like of a class or something. And we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. The next thing you'll see um, Java developers tempted to do is um, try to use the, there's a for in statement, which might be like a for each or something, where they try to, to loop over an array using this technique, and that's actually to get some weird problems. And so one of them, let's look at it. There's, um, we're going to create a new array. 
In JavaScript, you could just set any, even though we didn't declare a length, you could just pick an index and assign a, a value to it. Now, what you'll notice, even though we have one value in this array, JavaScript says the length is six because that's the, the highest index you gave it. So if you used a four in the array, it would only pick up the value that you put in it, which I'm guessing you wouldn't expect that. You might think it would go through each index, like zero, one, two, three, four, five, um, but it doesn't. Um, what you pro for an array, what you probably meant is just to use a standard for statement, you know, priming your index and incrementing it each time. And this would be considered a more best practice for an array uh, because it loops through all the indexes. Now, if you, you'll notice the indexes one through four are all undefined because we didn't set values for them, um, which is fine, but that's what I would expect. Um, and that's what you should, that's the best practice for arrays to use the standard four. Um, another problem of using the four in on arrays is a lot of JavaScript libraries um, jQuery doesn't, but like MooTools and there's, uh, Prototype is another JavaScript library. Uh, there's something called a prototype in JavaScript. Think of it like a, as a base class, maybe in, in Java, where you, you could like inherit some properties and values. And so um, it, let's say this is MooTools, for example, and they redefined, they added a property to your base class. Let's just think of that. The for in statement, if we looped over our array, would pick up whatever that library added to the array. Um, so what you'll see a lot of other libraries, they'll add some helper functions to arrays to make it easier to, to do certain functionality. And, and so this is probably not what you expected. And, and so again, use the standard for statement. So the next thing is using the for in statement incorrectly on objects. Um, you do want to use them on objects, but you, to loop over the properties, but you have to do something slightly special. Um, you need to, to check that the, the the key that you're looking at, the property that you're looking at, isn't on the prototype. You're not. You want to look at just the ones that you own, not the ones that you're inheriting from the prototype. And so, by doing this extra check, you're making sure the the property you own it, and then you can deal with it. So let's look at an, an example of what that might look like uh, to see the difference. So we're going to create a person uh, constructor. Think of this kind of like a, a class in Java, where you can pass in um, first name, last name, and assign it. And then um, we can new, new up the person and pass in the values. We're also going to set a prototype. So for this person, we're going to set some properties that are inherited by all objects is married and has kids. So we're going to new up two people, and then we're going to loop over them in two different ways. One, we're going to use the for n without the special if statement. And so you'll notice it picks up first name, last name, and then it picks up the, the prototype properties. But if you use the, the if check that has its own properties, when you loop over them, it'll only pick up first name and last name. Which in most cases, this is probably what you were wanting to do. You might have wanted to do this, but um, as long as you know the difference, you could do either way. So when it com comes down to it, remember one thing. Arrays use the standard for, objects use the for in with the special if and check. This is huge. Um, most Java developers I know don't understand the difference between scope, uh, between, diff between Java and JavaScript. So Java has a block level scope. Um, so you, anytime you see braces, you, you're, you know, you're confident that the variables within those braces are confined to that. But in JavaScript, scope is defined by the whole function. So let's take a look at this code, which works fine, but the person who wrote it didn't understand the difference. And so let's look at this. We're gonna ha we have an eat function. Thankfully, we've already eaten. <laughs> which has food and bacon and he's hungry. And so it's going to test, are you hungry? Yes. Uh, and then it's like, um, and then it's going to wait 10 minutes and then it's going to chew. But what you see here 
since I just told you that uh, JavaScript uses functional level, um, here's the beginning of the function, and then the end of the function is way at the bottom, like this is a subfunction. But he's declaring a variable here, thinking that it's going to remain in this scope, but it really it doesn't. Even though he's declaring var here, this scope for the if statement means nothing in JavaScript. Um, anything above it or below it or anywhere in this whole function could re reference this variable. Um, and so that's, in some cases, that's not going to hurt you at all, but we're going to look at some cases um, that it would hurt you. And so a better way to do this is to declare all the variables at the top of the function, like the first thing after the function, declare them, and then use them as appropriately underneath. And so that's why it's obvious to whoever sees it later about the scope. So best practice, declare all your variables at the top of the function. Um, when I used to write BB6 code back in the day, this was considered the way to do it, I'll declare all variables at the top. When I moved to Java or C Sharp, the, um, it was considered best practice to, to declare as you need it, but don't do that in JavaScript because we're going to show some problems <laughs> with that. So the next thing, and this, this piggybacks on the same topic uh, of declaring everything at the top. If, if you don't declare at the top, JavaScript's going to do it for you. And, and it uses something called hoisting, and we'll look at that right now. Um, so here is the similar type of code that we saw before not to do, where we have a say hello function, pass in a name, create a full name. We test it, and then someone declares a, ver a variable inside an if statement. That's considered bad. Now this code's still going to work when we pass in Carlos Ray Norris, it's going to say hello Chuck Norris, because that's his real name. But behind the scenes, what JavaScript does is it will take all variables, no matter where they are within the function, and it's going to hoist the declaration uh, all at the top and declare them as undefined. It will keep the assignments where they were. So here's where I appended all of them. And it still assigns Chuck here, but all the declarations were shoved away at the top. Now, in this simple code snippet, both of them work just the same. We're not doing anything crazy, but you just need to know when it, when it comes down to it, JavaScript's going to be doing this anyway. So here's a problem. Now, this won't actually run in Java, but here's a problem you could get in JavaScript. And actually, this is a this would work in raw C code. But we're, we have a nested for it statement. We're using the same variable. So in, in raw C, I would be defined in this scope, and then this would be a local I. Um, but what happens in JavaScript is it sees two variables. It hoists both of them to the top. So really, it's only one variable. And these will keep resetting each other over and over again, and this will be an infinite loop. Um, so that could be a subtle problem where you might think, oh, that might work. But yeah, in a huge code where you don't see the other one. <laughs> yeah, and this could be, yeah, some more, this, yeah, there could be a lot of code between this brace and this brace, and you could totally, uh, yeah, if, if you're not splitting out your functions, your code and functions, this could be easily buried on, like, you have to scroll and stuff, so. Okay, so this, this will take a little brain thought, but um, let's, look through this and we're, we're going to see where we get get into some problems maybe in some real world situations. So we're going to uh, print out a variable. You know, we're not declaring it or anything and okay, well it's undefined. That makes sense. I haven't declared it. Um, now I'm going to declare that same variable and give it a value. This is considered a global variable because we uh, it's just at the top. It's um, and global variables get stuck on the window. I don't know if you know that but you could access some window dot some variable and it would print out 42. So we're going to print out the value and it gets 42. That's what we expected. That makes sense. So now we're going to call this function. The first thing we're going to do is try to print out that variable. But it was undefined. And the developer's like, what? It's undefined. I thought that was a global variable. It sh I should have seen the value 42. I said it right here. What's up with that? And they get, they get mad. And so they're like, okay, well, I'll give it a value. And then they print it out. I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. It's one. Uh, that's what I expected, but I still don't understand why this is undefined. Um, so they go to print out the window sum variable, which is the global, 
and it gives it 42. You're like, wait a second, I thought I just set some variable here. Um, why is it 42? Well, the reason for all this is somewhere deep down in your code, some guy saw an if statement and de declared a variable called some variable, which conflicts with this name. So it goes, oh, well, this is going to be a local variable to this function scope. So what happens, due to uh, variable hoisting, the declaration got shoved way to the top of this function, got set to undefined. So let's look at the um, how JavaScript interprets it. Um, so what it did is it, it took that variable that was declared here, hoisted it way to the top of the function. So the first thing, it, it set some variable to undefined. So now this is local to this function. So when I try to print it out, well, it makes sense it's undefined because it got hoisted to the top as undefined. And so anytime I'm using it afterwards, it's, it's using this local variable instead of the global one. So that's why when I printed out the global one, it was still 42 because we were never using it the whole time. But the trick was somebody stuck a var way down here. So again, best practice, put all your variables at the top. <laughs> and you won't get into these problems. Okay, there's something also called function hoisting, and unfortunately the rules are slightly different. But um, once you learn them, then they make sense. So let's look at this. Um, <clears throat> the very first thing I'm gonna call a function, called say hello, I get an error because, well, that's not defined. You're like, okay, well that makes sense. I haven't declared the function, so when I call it, <clears throat> it's not there. So then I call it, try to say, good, say goodbye. But it works. You're like, wait a second. If this one doesn't work, why does this one work? I'm not declaring any functions above it. But what happens is there's actually two ways to declare a function. Uh, one's called a function expression, which you set a variable and set it to an actual function. Another's called a function statement. And you possibly might be more aware of this one, where it starts with the word function. You'll see this all over the internet. And it's not bad. It's just different. But um, And then you give it a name. So what happens behind the scenes is the function expression looks very much like what we're used to, what we, we, what we showed the last couple times. And it, what happens is it uses the same rules. So it's a variable, so it's going to use a variable hoisting. So it hoists the declaration uh, way at the top, but keeps the assignment here. But the function statement, if you see, if you see something that starts with a function, JavaScript will actually take the whole thing and move it all to the top, both the declaration and the assignment. So let's take a look what that looks like. So behind the scenes, JavaScript, in both cases, will shove them away at the top. JavaScript also hoisted the whole function of say goodbye to the top. So that's why when we called say goodbye here, it worked. But with the, um, the variable expression, or the function expression, it kept where it was. So that's why that didn't work. Um, and so really a, lo a lot of the articles that you see, people use the, um, the function statement because they know wherever they put it, it's going to be shoved all the The whole thing's going to shove the top and, and work regardless. Uh, so that's the main difference. So again, I re re reiterate. Always declare all your variables at the top of your function. If you do, you won't see any of these problems that I just addressed. Like, all of them go away. You don't have to worry about it. Because it's a confusing thing. The next thing is not using closures correctly. Um, we're going to take a, instead of explaining it initially, we're going to show an example of a bug that's kind of uh, strange and and we'll talk about how to, to resolve it. So this is a little bit of jQuery. Uh, I don't expect you to know jQuery too much. I'll just explain it as I go. We're uh, selecting an unor unordered list, and then we have a for statement that loops over that loops uh, loops ten times, and it will create a list item, give it the ID of the index, and give it a text that says you know say link zero, link one, link two, etc. The developer meant when they clicked it to say you've clicked, you've clicked zero, you've clicked one, you've clicked two, you've clicked three. If we run this, um, I have this hokey after I do it again. 
we run it, there we go. So it did print out these things, but if I click any of them, it gives me the same result. Click 10, you click 10, you click 10. And why it's doing that is because you're not actually running the function until a point later in time. And so at that point in time, the value i, once it gets out of the loop, is 10. So as far as this code knows, i is always 10. And so it's going to click, uh, you click 10, you click 10. So what we wanted to do is capture the value at the time we built up this function so that it would actually print out the value at that point in time. The way we solve that is to use a closure. Closures are confusing. Uh, if you don't know what a closure is, you may or may not understand it after I explain it because for most people it takes numerous times to, under to think about it to play with it, to make mistakes. Uh, but let, let's try to quickly go over it. So this is a source code from um, the Mozilla Developer Network, and um, which is a great resource. Um, it might not be beginner because it's kind of complicated. But So what we, we have a make adder function. And it actually, behind the scenes, returns a function. So this already looks kind of funky. Um, but this is the type of thing you need to do to create a closure. So I'll, I'll explain what it does. <coughs> we're going to call make adder and pass the value 5. So that gets shoved in here. So we're passing 5 in here. And then we're going to return a function that accepts another parameter, but uses internally what we passed in. And so it will actually, when this function returns, it will remember what the value of x was after the fact. So what we're going to do is we're going to call it add 5, just so it makes a little bit of sense later. And then we're going to make another one, pass in the value 10. It's going to return a function, and it's going to remember that value that we gave it, which is 10. And then we're going to store it in another variable. So these are both functions now, because I returned a function. So I could call these. So now I'm going to call the first one, add 5, and pass it 2. So it, it shoves the 2 into this inner function, and it's going to take two plus the value that it remembered. It enclosed memory around uh, the value of x previously. And so it's going to add them together and make a seven. And the same one before, we're going to take our function, add it to, it remembers 10 was the value of x, and it will give you 12. Um, and in order to try to make more sense of this, I made a diagram. It may or may not make sense, but we'll quickly show it. Um, I'll get different values. I'll get the appropriate index because it enclosed memory um, around the value that I gave it at that point in time. Another way to write this code that looks maybe less crazy is to still do the function that returns the function, but give it a name and then do it this way. Um, they both behave the same way, but this maybe looks a little bit less crazy. <laughs> um, so just know when to use closures. Uh, if you see weird behavior in your code, especially with click, click events or event handlers, that's not having the right values they expected, then you might need to introduce a closure. Um, and that's about where I'm going to leave that. The last point um, is consider bad practice to keep your variables and functions in the global scope. As I mentioned before, um, one, if you, don't if you don't declare your variables at all, they're going to be in the global. Anyone could access it. Other libraries could access it. Um, or if you just declare a variable at the very top of your page, any, any library could access it, which is bad. Because, and you might not know this, not only could you conflict with another library, but you could conflict with a Chrome extension, a uh, Firefox add-on. Like you might not know this, but all like if you were to look at my Google Chrome and I, I show you the debug window and show the scripts, if I click down scripts to try to debug my stuff, I'll see all the JavaScript for all the other plugins that are installed in my browser. And so you could conceivably clash with their names as well. So that's why you know in Java you have namespaces to try to prevent collisions of names. So you want to do the same thing in Java. 
script, sorry, JavaScript. But most people, a lot of people don't know that you can do that. So here's a lot of bad ways to do stuff. One, at the, just the very top, just declare a variable. That's global. Um, actually not defining a variable at all is global. Um, you'll see uh, people just putting functions at the you know, root level of their page. Those are considered global. Another library could call it. You might see some people try to get fancy and try to make their name really unique. So they'll have, you know, user group underscore function, like to try to make it really unique. But that's still on the global namespace. Uh, and unfortunately, I see a lot of code like that. And there's a lot better ways to do it. And as you can tell, everything I just defined above is all accessible off the window because they're all global, and we don't want that at all. So there's, I'm going to show you four ways, four ways to get around this. Each has their pros and cons. The easiest one is to use an object literal, and we kind of saw this already when we I showed you how to make a new object. So this one we're going, this is considered your namespace. So this one will be global, just like I showed you before. But everything that we want to use under it is off of that variable or object. And so we're going to have a skillet object, and it's going to have a, a property and a function. And so these are going to be public. Anybody could call them at any time. Um, and so this is a skillet object. I could call the ingredient and get bacon strips. I could fry it. Um, the cool thing is you could add new properties after the fact. So I'm going to add a quantity, and I could print that out, and I could add other functions anytime I want that weren't initially defined. But everything's going to be always public. Um, but the good thing about this technique is there's only one global variable, which is skillet, which is whatever your namespace is. This is probably the easiest thing to do. It cleans up the global namespace, so you only have one. Um, you could add functionality at a later point. Um, and everything's public, which you might consider a con. Um, another con is the syntax is slightly different. Like um, you have a colon here instead of equals, and you have to remember to put a comma here. And um, you know it looks a lot like JSON if you understand if you know what JSON is, but it's it's different. Um, so you might not like that. Um, and there's no concept of private properties or variables. The next uh, approach that we're going to take makes everything private. <laughs> There's no way to have public. And so um, in this technique, actually, there is no global variables, which is kind of crazy. We're going to introduce a concept called self-executing anonymous functions, which is a really crazy term. But what it means is we have a function with no name, and we're going to immediately call it after we defined it. And so after this point, there's no way to reference that code you just ran because there's no name. Um, so if we have any properties or functions, these are private. No one can call them ever again. But what I do at the very bottom is I call something to run at least once. And so if, if, if you want some JavaScript code that only runs once and no one could ever call it again, this would be a way to do it. So if we try to reference ingredients or frying after the fact, they'll all be undefined because there's no, no way to get that at all. You won't see that too much, but there might be a case for it. The pros, it hides everything. Um, you may want something to learn once, and it, it, the syntax looks a little bit easier. You got the equals and semicolons like you're used to, so that's a little bit nicer. Uh, the bad thing is, you know, if everything's hidden, you might not want to do that. Uh, and, well, and it's slightly more confusing, you know, this freaks people out, seeing this called immediately, but you get used to it. <laughs> so um, the next approach is kind of a combination to the two. Now you have public and private properties and methods. This is called the revealing module pattern. It still uses the, the technique that we just saw where we have a function with no name and we call it immediately. But the difference between this is we return something at the end. Last time we just called something, but now we're returning something. We're returning an object. I called it pub as an abbreviation for public, but the trick, the trick for this one is anything I add to pub 
like pub fry and pub ingredient, anything I add to that, it will be returned and those will be public. But anything that's not appended to that object that I'm returning, amount of grease or just whatever, um, will be private and only accessible to functions inside this scope. And so um, just like the object literal, this becomes your namespace. And so in this case, I have one variable in our uh, global uh, in the global namespace called skillet. And I could call, and I could call ingredient and fry as public, but if I tried to access, um, I don't think I'm trying to do that. If I tried to access the private ones, it wouldn't let me. A benefit of this technique is I could still add additional functionality after the fact. So I'm adding a two string function. Oh yeah, this one blows up. So I'm adding a two string function that references public properties, but I'm trying to access the amount of grease, which is private up here. And it's not going to let because it's private. So there's, um, so that's probably good. You don't, you don't want someone to, well, I'm going to add a new crazy function and try to access all your private parts. Um, so you can't do that, which is good. So the, uh, the pros are um, you have private and public properties and methods. The the code's easier to read because you could um oops crazy sorry I thought I got crazy um you still have the equal it doesn't look like that very first example with the colon and the commas you know, you've got the equals and the semicolons like you're used to um but the downside is if you wanted to add private functions or properties later, you couldn't. Um, so th this is the layer, very last concept in this whole presentation. This is um, this is probably the most flexible approach to handling all this. And this is the technique you'll see in like hardcore JavaScript libraries. Um, so it still uses the function with no name that's called below, but this time instead of just open print, close print, like we've shared all the time. We're passing some things in. So here's some crazy piece of code, which when I saw it the first time, I'm like, what in the world is that name? But the intention of this, let, let's say you have a library that has a, lots of components across multiple JavaScript files, but you want all of them to share the same namespace. Um, here's how you would do it. So what this is doing is like, oh, we're going to have a skillet namespace. Because remember, uh, we could access global things off the window. So we're going to have this skillet in the global. But we're going to use, we're going to use faulty values like we talked about the very first concept. So if the, if the namespace skillet doesn't exist, if it's faulty, then initialize it with a new object. So the very first time it's called, that's what it's going to do. Let's assume one of these has already been loaded. The second time someone tries to do this, Skillet will have a value, so it will just assign that value to the same value, and then it passes that in as skillet. And so at that point, you add your additional functionality and all that crazy stuff. We'll look in a second how to do that. The second parameter we pass is jQuery. Other JavaScript libraries do use the dollar sign, so it's considered good practice to not. Um, to protect against the dollar sign. And so by passing the full name of jQuery as your argument and using the, the dollar sign as a parameter, now we can use dollar sign in our code here and not be afraid of it conflicting with another com competitor library. And then this is a trick, and I'll explain what it is. You'll notice there's no third argument, but I have a third parameter called undefined. Unfortunately, JavaScript it has a series of reserved words, but undefined is not one of them. So some malicious person or someone who doesn't know what they're doing could define undefined as true. And that would screw up all your code because undefined is one of those faulty values. And so if it's set to true, it could screw up everything. And so um, if you have a parameter that wasn't passed, then it gets defaulted to the value of undefined. So by having the third one here and not passing anything to it down here, it automatically gets defaulted to the value that you want it to be. So undefined will be undefined always. 
So you could use undefined in your code, and you're you're sure that it's going to be undefined. So it's just a trick to pr protect against malicious or unknowing people. So the technique is just the same as the one before. Anything you want to be public, you append to this um, namespace that you pass in. So ingredient will be public, fry will be public, but anything that we don't append to the namespace will be private. So is hot is private, add item is private. The cool thing about this is you could have another set of code just like I showed you that uses that same technique um, to build up that library. And so now I could actually um, add new methods, new public methods, but also I can have private properties that I'm adding to this library um, that this, this function could use that private property. Um, and so it's a way you could build up things up nicely. And um, this one has the most benefits. Um, I guess the con would be it's more confusing, but. The benefits, you have public and private properties and methods. Um, the code inside of, of the, it looks normal. Um, it protects against malicious undefined people. <laughs> uh, it protects uh, the dollar sign against jQuery. Um, and you can build up libraries across multiple files. And it's a, co a common technique you should be aware of because if you ever look at um, source code of libraries, um, that's what you'll see. So I showed you four techniques to protect against the global namespace. Um, I wouldn't always say pick the last one. The first one might be fine. And it's, it's quick and easy, but it helps you not conflict with other libraries or other plugins. So I would just say be wise in what you do. Um, yes, and so almost everything I've talk, talked about tonight, you're wondering, OK, am I making those mistakes? Well, if you, this tool right here alone will almost tell you everything I told you not to do. It will pinpoint them. So, for example, we're, let's go to. I have a file in here, bad JavaScript code, which is a combination of code from this presentation. So, if you go to jslint.com, actually, let's just go to jslint.com instead of running it. Um, so, Douglas Crockford wrote this tool. He's the one who came up with the JSON language, which serialized JavaScript. Um, you just run it, it will give you a bunch of errors. And so most of these we talked about. Um, instead of using the not equals, I expected the not double equals, which is exactly what we told you. Instead of using the double equals, I expected the triple equals, which is what we talked about. Um, instead of using a new object, why don't you use the object literal notation? Instead of using new array, why don't you use the literal the uh, array literal notation. Um, here's a good one. Instead of using, uh, when you're using a for in, um, make sure to use the if statement to test if the has own property thing we talked about. The, the error message is a little confusing, but when you know the technique that we talked about, it makes more sense. Um, it, it warns about global variables. Um, the cool thing, it actually it recognizes global variables. Make it bigger. Um, it will say, okay, I found all these things in the global. Um, and if you'll notice the, I told you this is a way some people try to protect their function names by prepending it with a namespace. It will it's still global even if you prepended something to it. So, um, so anyway, this is a really good tool to use. Actually, when you first run it, it's really funny. Says so Jason Lent will hurt your feelings <laughs> because it's very strict. Um, some people, I, I use this as a guideline. I'll run it on my code. There's some things I'm like, okay, that's all right, you know. But it's a it's 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 a sanity check. Uh, and there's some settings you can alter. But um, overall, it's it's a really good tool to, just to pinpoint some of those those problems you might have. Um, so some additional resources. Uh, I already mentioned Douglas Crockford. He wrote that tool. He wrote a book called JavaScript: The Good Parts, where he explains there's there's certain things that you shouldn't ever use in JavaScript, uh, like the eval or the with statement. Um, and then he shows you the good parts, and he explains most of these concepts I've talked about. 
Um, if you don't like to read, <laughs> then most everything is in a video series on Yahoo. It's called Crockford on JavaScript. There's like a four or five part series. Each one's like an hour long, but he goes over these concepts and a lot more. Um, very smart guy. Uh, actually, Script Junkies, even though it's Microsoft backed, backed, they have a new website called Script Junkies where uh, most of the articles aren't related to Microsoft at all. It's like JavaScript tools, libraries, CSS. There's some good articles on what closures are, uh, goes in more detail, and prototypes and stuff. Uh, a little plug for me, I'm trying to present this at a conference, at a Microsoft conference, so if you could vote for me, it would be appreciated. Bitly, etm-mix11-vote. Um, I spoke at it last year um, as a, a write-in. Um, they're currently voting and the top 10 people get picked. Um, and again, if you feel free to email me, Elijah.Manner. I'm on Twitter, ElijahManner, ElijahManner.com. And is it an online conference or? No, it's in Vegas. Okay. Um, it's a, if you've ever heard of PDC, it's kind of like PDC but smaller. Um, usually more techie people. Um, well, technique people go to PDC as well, but 